Okay. So hello everybody. Thanks for coming, especially for having wake up so early this morning. Hope it was more easy for you than for me. And this talk will uh, basically uh, deal with cybercrime in nowadays businesses. So just a few words about me. Uh, I'm the guy who works for ITIC Bridge, uh, an ethical hacking company based in Geneva, where I manage the ethical hacking department. This conference basically um, will deal with uh, nowadays cybercrimes. Oh, just put some time. Uh, which have become more sophisticated, which usually uh, know often targeted businesses which may be uh, ordered by unfair competitors. So uh, rules have changed and this uh, talk is all about this, uh, this matter. So it's a real post-investigation uh, study which occurred last year uh, in Geneva. And uh, the client will be named here Fedor Bank, Fedor Trading to, to hide his uh, identity. The talk will only last uh, one round of 50 minutes. So it's quite short for, for to see a whole investigation. So I will try to, uh, to save the most time that I can so that we can cover everything. So please keep your question uh, for the end because they may have been answered automatically uh, uh, until the, the, the last slide. And um, don't worry if we go quickly over some slides. Uh, everything will be made public, uh, the video also. So you can, you can basically go everything without writing anything. The project context, basically, just in a few words. Last year, uh, the CTO of a well-known financial institution contacted us. And basically, they were thinking about a potential uh, attack against their system. But they were thinking about just a kind of phishing attempt and basically, the CTO didn't want to, uh, uh, to, do, to contact us. He was obliged to do this for political reasons. And um, he only wanted us at the beginning to go with a, a quick investigation. And the aim was clearly to help him reassuring his CEO that everything was under control and that nothing really serious occurred. Unfortunately, uh, he was wrong, as you will see yourself in the next slide. So we began with uh, only uh, one thing that we could have begun with, which is uh, which are the, the emails that uh, some employees in their companies have received. <coughs> so those mails basically uh, contain uh, a, a text which is quite quite good and quite technical. At the very first glance, uh, we were not thinking uh, that it was a phishing attempt. Because first, you don't have several grammatical faults per line, such as uh, all, uh, all kinds of phishing attempts which come from China, Russia, and so on. Uh, the text was sophisticated, and it dealt with a real matter uh, of forex trading at this time. So I'm not a guru in forex. I don't know pretty much nothing in forex, but everything was very really convincing to me. So since the beginning, we, we were disagree and uh, we were sh thinking that it was most unfortunately a targeted attack that just a simple poor phishing. So SMTP EDOS uh, clearly reveal an IP address. Uh, other um, EDOS are just not really interesting and may have been easily crafted, so don't focus on them. We had an IP address which uh, was hosted in the Uni United States with a domain which existed since two years, nothing quite unusual, which uh, was uh, a Neo Interactive. And uh, if we look at this uh, the, the website, basically, without going into too technical de details, uh, we, we just um, noticed quite quickly that it was uh, not a secure web server. Uh, it has a lot of mistake configuration and uh, old components. Basically, it was quite possible for someone who has a few skills to compromise it quite quickly. Uh, moreover, uh, if you do just a simple <laughs> DNS uh, reverse lookup, uh, we noticed that there, there were more than 80 domains which were hosted on, uh, on the same server. And most websites were also uh, did also contain some uh, web application uh, co uh, code, pr code problem in the, in, the, in the own code, in fact. So a lot of factors which uh, all together combined give us a strong likelihood that something wrong occurred and that the web server may have been uh, compromised 
most probably just to send some crafted mails which uh, could uh, permit hackers to remain anonymous. <coughs> Another bad point for, for Fedor trading is that um, this domain uh, did have an MX record. And so basically, uh, all people who received the mail most probably uh, received it in their inbox. If they did not carry out more uh, deeper investigation, there is no reason for, for those mail to have, been to have reached uh, the junk folder. So, once again, it was just a feeling at, in, at this point, no technical skills, no, no real investigation, but we were thinking that uh, the web server, was, uh, a web server was compromised to carry out a specific targeted attack against this trading institution. So uh, mails were not exploitable anymore. We, uh, we, we did ask uh, more information, and we wanted our client to give us some uh, FTP credentials to, uh, to get more information in uh, web server logs. So this leads us to the very first beginning of uh, the real analysis. The client side, uh, the, uh, the client website analysis. <coughs> so basically, his website was hosted externally at Informaniac, and uh, at very since the very beginning, we could uh, notice that uh, there is some mistakes in the in the development of the website. Uh, for example, the robot.txt uh, crawling uh, file was a little bit talkative. It, it's not so amazing, it's not so dangerous, but in only one second we could easily identify some potential sensitive resources which, uh, which may help someone to do nasty things. You can see the development interface, which usually are far, far less secure than the production one. We can see the administration uh, resources. So first thing was just to have a look, maybe because we were thinking that something wrong happened and basically that their own website was compromised. But the client didn't agree. He was thinking everything was fine. And his own word was, if we were compromised, I don't think so, but if it were the case, it was maybe just for a potential publicly available web interface. Everything is you know, removed, secured, and uh, basically don't waste your time. But uh, we really insisted to, uh, to care with this kind of, uh, of uh, pre-investigation. Uh, the existing account did not reveal anything really suspect. We, we just had a look if maybe uh, there was a compromise, maybe some uh, people may have forgotten to delete uh, an account, something like that, but everything was fine. Only some uh, old accounts which were not used anymore and uh, also bad practice, but nothing really serious. So we downloaded a huge amount of logs to, to carry out further investigation locally. It was uh, the only point we had at this time. And everywhere in logs, you could have uh, noticed that they were uh, under attacks quite frequently. Well, it's not so, s so abnormal because first, it was a web server, so it is publicly available, and therefore um, nearly uh, every time uh, attacked by scripts and so on. But the second reason is that it's a, it's a trading uh, system, so they may have more enemies than you and me, so it's quite okay. In those logs, we can see, for example, some um, uh, directory transversal uh, attempts, some null byte injection, uh, which are really a uh, lot of queries in a few times. It was automated tools. Nothing really serious, but just to prove that, yes, they had enemies. So we had uh, a hard duty, which was to investigate a lot of logs because we didn't have any time frame. We were thinking that they have been compromised. But it was just a theory. We, we don't have any proof for that at this time. And <coughs> if it was the case, we even don't know when. Maybe it was two years uh, before, because the client just did not know what happened. So we had a lot, lot, lot of logs. And it was not so easy to find something. So we, we, we ran some queries to, uh, to detect some patterns. Uh, we quickly identified some, um, some problem. And, uh, at, uh, as this was a uh, um, slow queries because a lot of logs, we just try to manage our time better. Uh, and therefore, we, we just have a look manually on, on the security level of their own website. And we identified a few pro problems. One of them catched our intention. It was a, uh, a potential SQL injection. But fortunately for them, uh, their WAF was doing quite a good job, and uh, it was not possible to exploit it really, only to have some, some, some error message or, or no web page. But another proof that um, they may have more problems than the, they were thinking about. 
<coughs> so we passed for usual SQL injection because it was clearly the ID you now, and we identified a lot of uh, of such attacks uh, in logs. Most of them were only um, automated exploitation tools, so not something really uh, convincing. But we could have noticed that uh, most injection were quite uh, tricky. It we are really far from just the one or one is one one. Oh, I was thinking it was my breakfast. No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, quite tricky um, uh, SQL injection. But uh, nothing uh, was proven in the logs that uh, that uh, they were successfully exploited. But if you go deeper into details, we could recognize some constants in hexadecimal. And uh, in other parts of the logs, we could have noticed some banners. But those constants uh, are really used in uh, one tool, which is called Hafiz, which is uh, used in Arabic countries. But uh, Hafiz was clearly used uh, in lots of SQL, SQL automated injection in this case. So what, what happened at this time? The, the good point for us was to try to know what kind of information those hackers may have been uh, accessed with this tool. So we downloaded the current version of Tafij, which was the 1.2 version. Uh, it is a newer version, though quite more powerful, but at this time it was the 1.2. And we have run it against the client infrastructure. So fortunately for them, uh, it didn't manage to do anything, but, but it was still able to dump the database name. So for us, it was a kind of small bingo because we could say, OK, you have a real problem. We can, we can have the name of your database. So even if Afij didn't manage to, to recognize how many columns uh, were in queries, and even if he, f he gave up after the 32 attempts, um, we definitely had a POC of uh, SQL injection vector. So um, with all this information, we told the client, OK, for us, uh, there is something more. We really need to, to investigate more things. So uh, you don't have much time. Uh, we also we, we need more uh, access on your website, because we need to, um, to know the, that the table names to, to craft some, some very uh, um, fine-tuned queries to identify where the attack may have occurred. The client was OK, give us everything we wanted. And we, we accessed the uh, um, Infomaniac web administration pages. So now we, we knew the table names, uh, the database names, the uh, sensitive fields, and we could um, manage to have more uh, fine tuned queries. And it was more fast, much faster. In a few seconds, we quickly notified new attacks, which this time, unfortunately for the client, was uh, real attacks, uh, malicious attacks and, and <coughs> successful attacks. So we could have seen some um, anonymous line which uh, clearly so showed that uh, the clients uh, have been hacked. And in fact, most tables were remotely dumped. It was possible to, to collect all customer uh, email addresses and dump uh, hash password and, and so on. So the IP uh, who initiated this attack was in Iran. Uh, it didn't offer any publicly available services. It was most probably just a simple bot to hide the ha <coughs> uh, anonymity. So what's, what's next? Um, so cl the problem maybe was that the client, um, all OK, he has most of the parts use his own self-made code, but he also relied on Joomla, which is not uh, maybe the first choice to, to owe some sensitive data for a forex trading company. But the problem was not in Joomla, because for this, ta this time, Joomla was uh, pretty well secured. It was patched for everything, and there is no problem in Joomla. The problem was in one of the commercial plugins. Uh, so unfortunately, the client pay paid to have something which was professional. And, uh, and he installed uh, a module. I even don't know how to read it. ECH404 CIF. Don't uh, know how that, that can be read. but. This module is quite famous uh, in the security modules for Joomla. Basically, it's, it's just uh, uh, SEO optimization analytics and URL uh, rewriting, which permits to basically prevent a lot of web attacks, such as flooding and XSS and this kind of, uh, of nasty things. But unfortunately, it was uh, this module which uh, permitted someone to inject uh, their own SQL code. So in that particular case, the security module brought insecurity to, to the client. So let's go deeper. The SQL injection was indeed a little bit tricky to exploit. 
And the point uh, uh, is, is that th there were no possibility to exploit it automatically. That means that we have lots all the automated tools you can know uh, about SQL injection and web, web exploitation, and none of them was able to even detect anything wrong. That means that it was not um, just a, a script kiddie attack. We, we did not know what to do the night and run some things and, uh, and get a shell and do some things. No, it was really most probably just a targeted attack made by someone who, one, had time to do this, and two, really, uh, really had some financial um, way to, to proceed. So as a proof of concept, we, uh, we have digged uh, with uh, the aforementioned vulnerability, and we, uh, we crafted ourselves 12 uh, URL, which as a POC demonstrated to the client that we can basically uh, take control of the whole backend database. Those are the 12 database uh, um, HTTP queries, uh, and we will go into detail with each of them just to make a, a short reminder on SQL injection. So what is, what is nice uh, from a technical point of view in this SQL injection is that all information leakage in this case occurred in the title bar of the internet browser. It's not so usual. The first query is nothing really serious. It's just to identify the PHP engine, which permit to, uh, to think about more specialized payload for, for typical um, version of PHP. Next request uh, just permits to retrieve username and database name. It's quite the beginning of such an attack. So three following requests permit to list databases. We add three databases. The first one is, is the information schema. It means that we only have two real databases on this production server because the next query did not uh, have any, any results. You can see that it's a standard Mozilla Firefox title. That means that uh, there were only three databases on the, the, the database management system. So two next requests permitted to, uh, to dump the, the schema and to, uh, to attack tables. And as soon as we had tables, it was possible to enumerate tables. And basically, in the 11th request, we enumerate all the columns from a specific tables which was interesting because we identified these tables previously. And the last one was the real payload. We can dump uh, record per record uh, all sensitive data uh, uh, regarding uh, tr trade, uh, trader user, uh, Forex trading system. So we, can we could collect uh, names, emails, uh, hash password, and so on. So right after we automated this kind of, uh, of, uh, of payloads uh, ourselves, and, uh, and we, we showed that it was uh, quickly uh, possible to, to dump all personal data for the customers of our clients. So the good things, well, if there is some good thing for at this time for him, is that since uh, version 1.5 dot something of Joomla, uh, password hash are salted. That means that um, you cannot easily uh, get uh, the password when you, when you compromise the system and only have the hash. The bad thing is that uh, one account, only one account in all accounts that we could have dumped, um, didn't have any salt. Most probably because it was an old account which was used by uh, by a consultant. Uh, that's a story revealed after that, and uh, and it was created with an old version of Joomla before migrations, and the account was never updated with a password change and so on. So that means that, unfortunately for them, there was one account, an administrator account, which have no salted password and which could be break in a few seconds. And it's still funny to, to notice that we, are sti we have still a lot of users who at this time who are still using the name of their, f of their wife, of their daughter, of their pets in password. So it's a financial trading institution. There are external consultants and you can see that the password was Julia. So the client himself didn't have any problem with his employees. All passwords were quite strong, and we didn't manage to break them with dictionary attacks, for example. So the only one good point for him is that um, this was not made publicly available because the hackers did, did not use these accounts to break anything. So maybe they did not notice or did not want it to attack this account. Um, but maybe also it was just because even if they, they, they saw it, 
maybe they just didn't want to, uh, to break anything because it would have been counterproductive, as you will understand when, when all the puzzle will be clear with uh, this full attack concept. So here are just a poke that all the passwords uh, were more protected. And that's it for the client uh, mail analysis. So uh, now we have the biggest part, which is the malware analysis. The only remaining part we could have was to focus on the, the PDF file, which was embedded into, uh, into the fake mails that everybody could have received. So there were several emails which were sent with different, uh, different uh, scenario attacks, different social engineering uh, modules, in fact. But uh, all PDF was the same version PDF. Why PDF? Because it's still today the most prevalent method for remote exploitation. Everybody uses PDF in all companies. All perimeter firewalls uh, clearly authorize PDF to, to, to reverse. And it's widely used for drive-by download or drive-by exploitation on website. You could uh, easily send some so social engineering email with such attachments. So basically, yeah, you, you, you must uh, fear PDF today and probably tomorrow. And last point is that it's really hard for antiviruses to investigate into PDF. PDF are, are really different from predictable binary file. And uh, so that's such a challenge for antiviruses for the next year. For example, uh, last year, the 9th October, uh, there was only four antiviruses on 43 that detected a potential threat in this PDF. That means a really raw detection rate of about 9%. And the um, third October this year, so much time uh, later, we still have a, a detection rate of about 37%, despite the, the time that antivirus vendors uh, did have to, to update signatures and do things. So basically, really dangerous. Why? First, because a PDF do support a lot of compression formats, which means different way to store data, which means different way to obfuscate code. It also supports encryption natively, Different encryption, strong encryption. And they support uh, hexadecimal form, Unicode, from shark code, other, other things which may help someone to hide something. They have some logical streams which may be quite tricky to understand and may permit to store other objects. Each of them can also store some other kind of components, such as action scripts through uh, flash component, for example. So basically, uh, you, can, you can hide a lot of things and do a lot of things with PDF. In this case, this PDF uh, use was a zero-day attack. It relied on a specific uh, vulnerability that we will uncover now, um, which basically permitted to inject code in all <coughs> versions of uh, Adobe uh, programs until version 9.4, which only was made publicly available uh, the 5th of October. That means that everybody who have received the mails, uh, most probably, have executed code without even noticing anything. So the beginning in this, in this kind of forensics is to, to just have a, a quick analysis of what's happened in the PDF. So with a PFID, for example, you can search for risky keywords. Here, we can see several interesting things. You can see that there is some embedded JavaScript with uh, automated actions performed at the beginning by the PDF rendering application. You can see that there is some encrypted part. And something quite unusual, the document seems to have contained several pages, which is not so usual in a malicious PDF crafted uh, file. But it was a false positive. It, 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 the file was so damaged uh, that, in fact, you were thinking that a lot of things which were not true. And uh, an acro form, which uh, can also uh, be used as a trigger to execute something. So if you look, next, w next step is to look at uh, the, the entropy. The entropy, basically, you can notice that the total entropy is uh, the entropy inside stream are uh, really near from the max of 8, which would have suggested a quite normal PDF. But if you look also the entropy outside stream and the quantity of bytes which are uh, after the last end of file tag, which is not so normal for, uh, for, <laughs> for such a tag, then you would have led to another conclusion, is that uh, they may lead us to think that it's a malformed PDF, and data was most probably added uh, out, um, 
without stream objects outside. So basically, that's all. And it was true. In fact, the file was so damaged that if you wanted to, uh, to analyze it deeper with, for example, a walker, uh, which is a of origami, a nice French tool, uh, basically it cannot do anything. It, uh, it just led me to into error. The client side uh, command was the same, the same problem. Well, it could have confirmed some things, but basically not usable. In fact, even if you use it with some version of Adobe Reader, the Adobe Reader program itself was rebuilding the file because it was thinking it was damaged. Unfortunately, it was damaged in a specific way that only him was able to reconstruct everything and could be, could be pulled, in fact. So from a pure technical view, again, everything is really, really, really nice. The logical flow uh, could be easily identified without any problem. But despite, we were still not able to extract JavaScript. For sure, uh, we tried to do it manually. We, we search for specific keywords. We identify several objects, the 3 and the 7 and the 30, which do remain uh, the triggers of uh, the JavaScript code. But all of them was quite obfuscated. Uh, we don't manage to understand what was it. Some was on 2 bytes, on 3 bytes, on 1 byte. Because what you must know is in usual uh, PDF attacks today, uh, hackers generally obfuscate things, that's clear, but uh, they do it in quite predictable way. In fact, they often use a simple XOR uh, algorithm with only one byte length uh, to, to hide some things. And they may also proceed with some uh, rotation on left, rotation on right, double rotation, super rotation. But it's basically, it may be complex to analyze, but basically it's only right on those two operations. So in most cases, you can just do an XOR <laughs> search uh, from DD Stevens, and you can uh, just search for specific keywords, such as HTTP, which most often are used in Exploit to connect to a website and download some things. But here, nothing happened. The only one solution at this time was to reverse engineer everything. So let's do that. We have no choice. So uh, we could have seen that it was easily, but this screen capture was uh, taken after several hours of investigation because uh, we do not know everything where, where we were in, in this uh, encrypted file. But uh, after um, letting decrypting some things, we, uh, we clearly see a really nice, in really interesting uh, assembly code. We have let some comments on the right to help you understand what basically was. But you can notice um, an XOR key on four bytes. No, com no public tools use decryption on four bytes uh, XOR key. So as soon as we had these keys, ah, it was a, a kind of small victory because uh, no, we, we could have done some research uh, more, more seriously. For example, we were able to extract ourselves some, uh, some uh, payload which was, um, uh, which was embedded into the PDF file which was not possible before. It was the MIA DLL file, which was embedded to this, uh, to this exploit. <coughs> this file, fortunately for us, was not encrypted. And uh, we could have get more information without taking two days to, uh, to go into uh, encryption, uh, low-level uh, skills. It was not encrypted, and we could have dumped some strings. But we will see later, because they will be used later. The, the attack is quite, quite complex and has more, more chain. So what happened exactly was for, the, for the trigger? Basically, it was a cool type DLL which was abused by, uh, in Adobe Reader and uh, which, uh, which has done a string cut on a unique name failed from the sync table. It was this uh, vulnerability in this CVE. So again, screen captures where you can see basically <coughs> where occur. Um, here we have the call to the function which, uh, which calls uh, the buffer overflow. Here we have the preparation to point to the, to the offset field of the sync table. And uh, basically, in uh, DDAB, you have the victory from, uh, from hackers. Here, just a small zoom to, to show in debugging mode what's happened when you, when you try to crush a really long, long buffer into a 28 long buffer. So let's summarize what we know until now. We had some Acroform JavaScript which detected, we did not see in the assembly, but the code was very professional. We had a JavaScript which detected which version of Adobe Reader was used, and we jumped to specific code. 
After that, we had an spray with a put uh, rope data into memory. So it was a return-oriented programming exploit. So basically, uh, we also had technically huge red sled, which acted as a knob sled for transiting between the stack buffer overflow and the rope payload. Don't go into too, too technical detail right now. Uh, what I is really interesting, we will discuss it uh, in a few slides, is that uh, we the ICU CNV DLL was used because it's uh, not an ISLA enabled DLL and offer a lot of uh, nasty things for attackers. So basically, attackers use a rob techniques uh, and redirect flow to, the to some code section into a DLL instead of the heap and uh, permitted them to have the executive rights. So basically, they change some calls on this DLL to craft their payloads. And they also used a really nice trick, which was never seen uh, before, uh, one month before on, on the wild, for example. Uh, they used, for example, a uh, secretion of uh, uh, an empty file somewhere, which just permitted it uh, to be mapped in memory and benefit from an executable tab uh, space. For example, it would have enabled them to put a shell code and execute it even on, the, on a DEP enabled system. So let's talk about the ICU CNV 34 because it's nice. Now it's uh, something which is quite famous in the exploit development uh, underground community. But at this time, it was, it was fun and nice. So basically, it's a DLL which is not compiled with an SLR and therefore is always loaded at the same place on your system. So basically, if a program uh, managed to load it, he is able by, by the import address table of this ICU CNV 34 DLL to predict all uh, SLR IP address of the system. So, knockout. The program was able to bypass DEP, was able to bypass uh, address space layout randomization. And, uh, and as it didn't use any XP uh, hard coded syscall, it also worked on Windows Vista and on Windows 7. So, really nice exploit. So, yes, finally for the client, it was game over. So, <laughs> everything was done. All, all his client could have executed any kind of nasty things. And yeah, just a few things, but uh, there is some uh, some tricky things from Acker which prevented us to to hackers did not want us to to analyze everything. So they put a lot of things to prevent to to make our life much harder. And I must say that they succeeded in some ways. <laughs> so for example, uh, we didn't we were never able to exploit a memory breakpoint. Each type each time we use memory breakpoint, which would have been really useful because it was unpacking himself on some part of memory, so it was really nice for us to use it. But each time you use memory breakpoint, bang, we arrived in a long loop. We don't know why, we don't know how, but at the time of the loop, it depends, the, the time depended, but at the time, it's rose an exception, and we were game over. So we also noticed that, um, that the MIA DLL file at, those at uh, some points overwrote its own text section. Uh, why? Because you must have wanted at some point to say, ah, these hackers are really disturbing me. I don't want to analyze every encryption system. Let's do it. I will run the everything, and I will attach with, uh, for example, log PE, and I will dump what's running in memory, which is already unencrypted by the process mapping, and I will get everything for free. So basically, if you wanted to do this, mm, you, you could not. Because uh, if you don't know at which time to attach uh, uh, and to dump, you will have just dumped just crappy things. Another trick was that uh, this, pr this program passes some um, process all process names. And for example, uh, if you <coughs> just run a proc, uh, proc bone uh, with his own real name, you, you, arrive, you arrive to different, different things uh, and nearly no things. You, you had to rename the proc mon to be able to make a quick uh, behavioral uh, analysis. There is also things we discovered yesterday when we, we, will, we will see the video, because a friend of mine, Brian uh, Kolax, at the end of the room, uh, gently proposed me to make a small video of these things so to show you something at the end when I was finishing my slides. Yeah, bad students, I do it yesterday night. And um, so basically, we discovered other things that we have not put uh, into, but there are some anti-debugging techniques which were, uh, basically the mal malware was triggering different code if you run it instead of VMware, for example. You will show it in the, in the demonstration. 
from a file mount short source that unfortunately we were thinking yes we are the end of the fight we know everything we could we everything will be qui will be done quickly no 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 it's but not finished we detected other binaries uh, adobe one binary which was not created if you run uh, vmware for example but uh, you can see everything quickly this adobe one binary uh, was written uh, by a semi adll file this one was not encrypted uh, also it was a dropper you could have dumped some uh, ASCII uh, clear text from it, for sure. It could have been a trick because <laughs> at this point we didn't trust anything. <laughs> but uh, it was not a trick. You can see the create file, what try with permit to, um, to, to write a stream. You can see some IP which uh, will connect to a, an, uh, uh, a remote system to download some things. Basically a, a downloader. This was also confirmed with the behavior analysis where you can see uh, we, we've put a rock DNS services to redirect traffic to one of our server, and therefore we can reach one of your computer. And uh, we could have noticed quite quickly that uh, the program tried to download updatedo.x on, on, uh, on a website which was bringing home you, dude. It makes us smile. And at this time, here we are. The final payload of all these nasty things was to download another executable, the update to binary which was in fact uh, a Trojan, banking Trojan based on the spy highs, derived from spy highs, with new things, uh, but it was based on this one. So let's summarize everything because it's, uh, we have gone quite deeper now. By just opening an, uh, just a simple PDF file in a social engineering email, clients have generated without noti noticing it's a MIA.dll file, which was injected into process memory of several systems and uh, which in turn executed uh, a dropper, downloaded and executed a dropper, uh, downloader, Adobe One, which downloaded from Bringing Home Jude and another final payload, which was Update 2, which in turn was copied in two different locations with a six-digit randomized name and which ran into memory. This was the final aim of attackers. This so what's happened on those two uh, new files? Adobe One files was just simple loader, not uncreated. The second one, the last file, was a C-sharp based binary, a huge, a really, really heavy uh, C-sharp based. And despite it was a C-sharp, it was not possible to, to obtain the original code with some automated tools, something like that. It was uh, much more, uh, even much more protected than uh, the previous part, which was also quite protected. So it relied on base 64 for data, MD5, triple days, AES, lot of encryption algorithms which are not uh, blockable so easily. And those files, unfortunately, were undetected by most antiviruses. Only a few uh, uh, European solutions were detecting some things uh, in those two new files. All antiviruses from the East countries were quite inefficient, which lead us to think, <coughs> but it's only a theory, it leads us to think that it was initially an attack which was m aimed to target the Russian segments. Because hackers specialize the codes to evade some specific protection depending on who they want to attack. So basically, different dates and uh, different results. Uh, the 8th October, only 37% of detection rate for those binaries. And uh, one week later, 44% after we have pushed a lot of signatures and called a lot of, uh, <laughs> of vendors. But this year, in June, uh, you, we, you had still one antivirus on five which didn't uh, detect anything. Winners were not uh, maybe the expected ones <laughs> because we, we have, uh, we have uh, Microsoft, uh, Sophos, McAfee, Kaspersky, and other antiviruses which are famous, JData, Sophos, Panda, were the next winners. Uh, they arrived one or two weeks later. And uh, other antiviruses mm, still remain not so efficient. So the final payload, uh, I've told you, was a spy highs the rift code, uh, behave like ZBoot. Uh, it basically tried to, 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 to steal sensitive financial institution credit card uh, data and, and, and for sure provide all other features of, uh, of Trojan attack. So we don't go into technical details, but basically it creates other files. Um <coughs> In it, it injects uh, uh, his own job files into uh, other memory space to, uh, to uh, benefit from privileged programs. It's, it's play with registry to make him survive reboots. It verified that it was called an, uh, from specific paths or that other 
binary exist or regist key, registry key binaries, common practices to disturb reverse engineering. It queries the LSA uh, to, to get the computer name and uh, at the very, 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 very beginning uh, list the, the wool that uh, drive uh, the, the, the wool folder uh, files uh, and, and create and give this result remotely. So also uh, some, um, some well-known well -known behavior for such programs. And finally, it tried to reach uh, two web servers uh, hosted in Korea. We also find some Unicode encoding in the last binaries, which seem to demonstrate that it was uh, really uh, done in Korea. Uh, those web server, okay, we will go, we will see it later. Right now, we have just IP poisoning ourselves uh, and simulating HTTP server to, to see what could have happened without making our Trojan communicate with a real bot header because we wanted to remain low profile and didn't uh, want him to, to detect us. So we can have detected the, the, the hello, I'm here from, from the Trojan, which were trying to communicate with the bot header. Um, basically, the first URL was nothing. Uh, it was just for redundancy. It was just forwarding all packets to the second one, just in case <laughs> authorities would have managed to take down the uh, web server. It, it would have been quite easy to, uh, to just continue to keep uh, nasty things. Those domains did exist since really long time, since 94 for the first one. It was really uh, old uh, domains, and they hosted lot, 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 lot of websites. One of them was hosting more than <coughs> 160, uh, 1,060 hundreds of websites. So a huge of possibilities for compromising. <coughs> Despite its parameters, which effectively sounds like a little bit weird, where you can see your username uh, in, in the URL, which usually is not really good for you, uh, the website itself also was was quite down. W it's nice, what nice job because if you look like this, you it doesn't look like uh, uh, a compromise. It, it doesn't look like uh, a remote CNC server, but it was a covered channel. If you investigate into packets, you can see that there is some hidden way to communicate and that there is something which were not displayed to you. So that's it. We're having the conclusion. Finally. The target was not uh, the client, uh, the, the, f the Fedor trading uh, client itself. It was his own customers. Uh, for sure, it also impacted the Fedor trading system. But uh, once his own website was compromised, everything occurred really, really, really quickly. And that means that everything was achieved and ready to use, and the, the, the real trigger was to add a way to compromise and to get email address. Uh, uh, as soon as they collected the email address, everything occurred the same day. That means that it was a well-organized system. And uh, basically, uh, it, was, uh, it was a real nice sophisticated attack, which was uh, afforded by uh, an infra competitor uh, and other trading companies, international companies, who we decided, we decided to, to attack a, a competitor and who rent services in the underground market. Because that's typically the point here. Uh, I just want to underline what uh, Miko uh, said yesterday. One of uh, the new rules of the games is that we have some specialized attacks of, uh, and that uh, hacking have become professional, and uh, that's the case here. If you, if, you, if you look globally, we have malware code writing modules with different coders because different uh, languages programming, uh, different skills, but we have different coders for the dropping, for the downloader, for the banking Trojan. We have some zero-day uncovering. We have social engineering module, which is also a specialty. We have web attacks, which was really uh, also nice attacks. And we must also have some money transfer option and this kind of uh, nasty things in the underground market. In fact, it's really a modern scenario attack where uh, every hacking group are specialized into, uh, into several services and rent services to other groups and, uh, and rely on services from others. You cannot enter this, uh, these groups without being knowing by two or three other groups. Basically, it's a real enterprise scenario. Uh, they works as all your companies. For, for sure, it's they have many business opportunities. It comes from many other countries. Most active are for sure China, Russia, and Brazil, but it's not limited to those countries. So the last slide is that, to conclude, there is much less hacking for fun and much more hacking for profit. Cybercrime has evolved, and uh, now there it's, uh, it, it has become an, a wool enterprise with a, a huge economy. And 
if you want to, to come uh, a bad guy tomorrow, you don't have even to, uh, to make your own code. You can rent botnet uh, for one hour, for two hours, for one week. Uh, you, can, uh, you can purchase a licensed malware which comes with his own technical support. Uh, so basically, <laughs> it's really amazing. <laughs> Cybercrime has now developed and, was and is spreading faster than ever. So welcome in the world wild web and uh, happy forensic for, for the following new, new years. And thanks for for all. I don't know if uh, we have time. If we oh yes, just five minutes. Perfect. It's the time for the demonstration. So here is the demo from Colax. Okay. So just run your debugger. From the debugger, run Acro RD32 because we don't want to to read. Uh, 100,000 lines of assembly. So we first run the, uh, the, the PDF rendering program. Then we open, we simulate the opening of the file just to, to go so deeper in, um, in the assembly. And then we just we remove one, bre one breakpoint. We only let one breakpoint on the string cat, string cat operation in the cool type, remember? So no. No, we will be able to open to, to run the program and to open the file for, for real. Let's play. We open definitely the infected PDF. We have the rebuilding process from uh, an old version of Adobe. And here we break we broke before displaying anything in the PDF. And uh, we had we can trust it. Uh, nearly everything because as as you remember uh, there is also some kind of, of anti-debugging techniques, and at one point, he will see that we have uh, Yem immunity which is running, and, uh, <laughs> and he, he will not finish something, but we will, uh, we will proceed uh, with another way. So we broke, we have the string cut. You can see on the stack uh, that something nasty will happen. We will overwrite something, overwrite something. No, we'll just make a breakpoint on uh, on the final uh, on the line in uh, in the cool type, which we call uh, is a pointer to our EAX address. And, uh, basically, we will it's it's the beginning of, of the exploit. <coughs> the ICU C, uh, CN uh, thirty something DLL that we have uh, discussed uh, uh, for the ASL bypass and. Just before uh, returning, we can see on the stack uh, that uh, there is some lot of uh, nasty thing, 41. It's only translated uh, by uh, an ink assay or something that doesn't do something really harmful for from a pure payload perspective. And here we have a lot of uh, red we will occur. So just go back at the end of the stack because we don't, we don't have time to follow each rate, which, uh, which is quite useless for us. No, just, so just identify some uh, an address where we could modify our stack pointer to just uh, go a little bit f uh, later in the time. We, we modify our stack pointer with this address because basically it will, uh, it will it's, it's a rope attack. Uh, you, you, you pop on the return address, which is on the stack, and each time you return and you return, you execute some some part of uh, useful code. So here you have the rope attack itself with uh, with the create file, which occurred. So you can see at the at the bottom it's a third um, breakpoint, which is we, we put some breakpoint on create file, create file w. Just some breakpoints, create ma file mapping to, to to make some break and enable you to see some things that we will not have uh, time to see in other reasons. Mapping here. And the last one on, on your file. So let's run. Yeah, we broke. We broke on create file hub. Fail A. Create file W. Create mapping file. Create mapping file I. Mapping file A. So here, basically, if we broke, we you can uh, you can see all that we discussed with the ICU, with the mapping of the ISO file. <coughs> here you have the extraction of the MIA DLL file in a TOM folder, which was uh, the DLL we were talking about for long slides. Here we are. 
<coughs> now we will just put uh, a, a small breakpoint more on load library to, to see uh, when this uh, nasty DLL will uh, be loaded into uh, the Acrobat reader process space. Here we are. And here we broke until written. And we have this near DLL file. So let's see the process to show you everything. We have now the MIA DLL file, which is here at the bottom of the screen. Right now, you don't have yet any Adobe one dot X. And you will don't have one because if you continue the execution, yeah, yeah, this this clever guy will see that we are running some anti-debugger. We have tried to put uh, several high debug uh, plugin and this kind of things to to, to, to hide uh, to hide us. But uh, no, we didn't have we didn't have time uh, for today to, to to detect where exactly it was running. But if you if you see we uh, at the bottom at the end we arrive in the ACH in the, the safe exception handler and uh, basically program will do other things and it will not finish. So okay, just just close uh, at this time the, the debugger and uh, and finish to, to, to load the real PDF ourselves in the PDF viewer. And it will detect there is no debugger attached to him and it will finish uh, the work for us. Okay. First, we just run a small script uh, which will, uh, as as you can see, it's two different steps. Uh, just one minute, it's finished. Uh, we just removed every temporary files with uh, a tiny batch to uh, to continue the, the the demonstration. It's only a few seconds left. So here we are. We are ready for continuing. Everything is clear from the computer point of view. There is still no Adobe uh, one uh, binary. Just remove last uh, file that we forgot and kill uh, an Adobe which was remaining in program, in memory. And now open open this nasty PDF directly. We have just redirected the traffic into our own web server because we did not want to download any Trojan. Well, the Trojan is not available yet on this, uh, on this URL. But so let's do that. Just double click on it. And while it's opening, you are yeah we have dead user. It's a zob, it's <laughs> it's a fake uh, Trojan that we wa which was installed. Uh, the user was spawned at this time. So that's it. Thanks for uh, for assisting this conf. Thanks my friend for the video. And I think uh, everything is no time up. We don't have remaining time for question, but for sure uh, you can reach us by mail. You can dis we can discuss uh, maybe uh, a beer. It's too it's too <laughs> it's too early, but maybe with a chocolate in the next room, no problem. So thank you.